Welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. The Pharmacy Leaders Podcast is a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network with interviews and advice on building your professional network, brand, and a purposeful second income from students, residents, and innovative professionals. Welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. As we move towards 2018, I want to send a special invitation out to students, residents, or fellows that are interested in creating a digital publication uh, to do a guest interview. So uh, contact me at aaguerra at dmacc.edu or tonyfarmd1 on Facebook Messenger. And tell me who you're thinking about interviewing, and we'll talk about it as uh, maybe a good idea for having a guest podcast episode so that not only can you get a digital publication out there, but maybe there's something innovative someone's doing that we just haven't heard of and that we should hear about. So I'm really excited again to introduce our guest for today. Uh, Syed Samad is from the University of Buffalo College of Pharmacy, a uh, great research university, and he talks a little bit about the way that they set up Dean's Ambassadorships uh, to not only help other people know about Buffalo, but also to mentor other students. I hope you enjoy uh, this episode. Syed Samad is a third year student at the University of Buffalo School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. He believes professionalism begins with a relationship between a practitioner and his patient. In March 2013, he started as a pharmacy technician for Wegmans, and he has a passion for community and global outreach, and became adept in providing pharmaceutical care locally and globally. Along with his classroom coursework, he believes his participation in medical mission trips, community outreach, and internship at Kenmore Mercy Hospital have made him the student he is today. Welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. Hi, thank you very much for having me here today. I'm very excited to talk about pharmacy and leadership. Well, tell me a little bit about uh, your leadership road. Everyone's leadership road is a little different. And you told me that uh, your work experience was actually a little bit uh, uh, non-traditional before you came to uh, Buffalo. Yeah, um, I guess, I don't know, non-traditional or maybe a little cyclic in the route. I uh, When I left high school, I'm going to be quite honest, I wasn't always going to pursue further education. I ended up actually going to a technical school and getting a certification to be an auto mechanic. So I worked actually for General Motors for about three years. About a year into it, though, I realized that's not exactly what I wanted to do and ended up going back to school, found my way from a community college to a SUNY Brockport, got a degree in biochemistry, and was accepted to the School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Scientists at University at Buffalo. And that really, um, what sparked that kind of was not only my brother kind of being in the pharmacy field, but him helping me get a job at Wegmans as a pharmacy technician, where I kind of made those first initial interactions between like a patient and um, pharmacy. And that's honestly where I feel professionalism lies is through that relationship. And it's just kind of snowballed since then. As soon as I got to the school, I, there's many opportunities there and things I especially focused on was um, community outreach, so volunteering and aspects of pharmacy along with global outreach, having the like opportunity to do medical mission trips, and overall just basically getting my hands into anything that I found interesting or remotely interesting just to see where I wanted to go because as many people when they're coming into pharmacy school are not always aware of what pharmacy can, where pharmacy can take them. So I just wanted to get involved in as much as I could just to see what I liked, what I didn't like, and what I wanted to continue to pursue. So tell me how someone goes from auto mechanic to biochem undergrad major. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a big push, you know, throughout the whole country that we want to get people in STEM fields. Uh, what was mm -hmm. it that made you say biochem? Yes, that's for me because that's going past inorganic to organic to then biochem, the application of organic. So how did that happen? I guess that was more just um, on accident than as impressive as it sounds like. Because um, I tried actually um, doing biology, and I like certain aspects of it. But as some undergrads may already know, biology is more of a language of its own. And it wasn't for me. I, I excelled at it, but I know I, I wasn't very passionate about it. While I was really interested in actually math and calculus, and then I saw chemistry, which was essentially just the application of science using mathematics. 
So when I transferred from my community college to um, SUNY Brockport, it allowed me just to basically, I had a very good mentor there, actually, Dr. Uh, Margaret Logan. She's the chair of pharmacy department now. But when I first went to talk to her, she was actually, uh, and I told her this was, I was interested in doing something in healthcare. Her first words were, Syed, you, you might need to work on your grades a little bit. And I think you <laughs> might want to focus down okay. on what you want to do. So it wasn't always positive. But um, honestly, just being determined and having her help me go through what I wanted to do, she kind of sprung the idea of maybe you want to be a biochem major and not just a biology major because it seems like you're doing much better in your chemistry classes and it seems like you have an interest more in that field. So she ve- definitely pushed me and I would always say like when you're, if you're ever uncertain, always ask like your professors, even if they don't seem welcoming or would like to help, they always want to help even though that might not be your impression as a student. And I mean, they've been through it before. You might be going through it the first time, but asking people who help students get to where they are, much like yourself, is how I think I went from being a mechanic to a biochem major, is just asking people their opinions and making a, like a shared decision with many, including my family and faculty members. So we're going to start with one of the leadership roads. Uh, you're the you're the Academy of Managed Care Pharmacy student. Is it the AMCP treasurer? Um, yes. Tell me how uh, you decided to just kind of volunteer and become an officer within a group. I think that um, I remember Tyler Dalton from Auburn said uh, that he just kept joining groups and just seeing if this fits. And even if you know you don't decide to go into managed care, at least you get certain skills and relationships out of it. Tell me about that first uh, leadership uh, road that you took. Well, that was more of um, uh, kind of in the same way. Just uh, I joined a lot of organizations, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And the thing that got me to managed care was actually one of my friends. Uh, she definitely influenced me to like push me to become uh, the treasurer, even though I, I wasn't exactly sure that's where I wanted to go. But she was like, you, you want to do this. I know you'll be good at it. I know it doesn't seem like uh, interesting now possibly, but she, she was totally right. Although like initially it didn't seem interesting to me. I didn't understand fully exactly what managed care was like the fact that it's taking monetary aspects of pharmacy practice and putting it to good use that you're basically the link between community chain pharmacists, community chain pharmacy and like health insurance plans. But at the same time, the impact in the inpatient setting with like pharmacy and therapeutics committees is also there along with branching out and making formularies it was just it was overwhelming when I actually got into it and that's probably what forced me more into that leadership role and as I got into it I actually went and observed PNT meetings or pharmacy and therapeutic meetings and got to see how pharmacists at the table use their knowledge to make an impact on other patients well tell me a little bit about um now uh, IPSF. Uh, if you could first tell us a little bit about what IPSF is. I understand it's sort of a part of APHA and it works with other countries. Uh, we've had other students that are in it. Um, but the first thing I want to do is kind of go over what it is and then we'll go over the value uh, of it. So first of all, what is APHA ASP IPSF? Well, I guess um, APHA IPSF, um, APHA is the the big organization, just like um, like the AMA or like just the Academy of Pharmacists, and the umbrella under their IPSF is the International Pharmaceutical Pharmacy Student Federation. So it's really that for us at UB, that's the organization where if you want to just help internationally, if you want to help your community, that's where you would go. The biggest thing our organization does would be um, it organizes all the mission trips that through the school. We do. Uh, we help a refugee family move in. Generally, the spring semester will help the a family move in. We also do a lot of uh, fundraising and volunteer work for the community. And an interesting uh, project that has, was started about uh, a year, year and a half ago, was the refugee education program that's also done through the IPSF um, organization. So it's really just more getting um, adept in different cultures and different patient populations that you might not always have the ability to do in a formal school setting. Um, I'm familiar with religious um, medical mission trips, but explain to me what a medical mission trip is. So 
Uh, something that our school offers is actually um, secular trips and non-secular trips, and it's completely your choice what you feel comfortable doing. For the non-secular trips and what I have gone on, it's, uh, I guess in the simplest terms, it gives you the opportunity to not only practice outside your scope, but to also see things outside of healthcare in the U.S. So it just really just, op- like, you might leave as a, person but you definitely come back with a greater appreciation i would say as far as a medical mission trip goes that's non-secular okay so i'm gonna um just give you my very limited international experience i we went to ireland Uh, my wife had a back pain we go into the pharmacist they actually gave us voltaren cream for like 10 euros and that was it there was no doctor there was no insurance there was none of that can you tell us uh, about your medical mission trip and maybe what is different about the country that you went to and what practices you see there that are different than we have here in the States? Yeah, yeah. And I think um, your experience in Ireland, although like, like and by no means do I have extensive international, you know, knowledge. But I've only, I've been to probably two countries. I've been to my uh, parents' home country of uh, uh, Pakistan and I've been to the medical mission trip in Haiti. And both places, the pharmacist is really that one-stop shop where you come in and you tell them your symptoms and they're able to give you something, uh, whether it be like a Voltaren or uh, maybe an antibiotic, where in a lot of countries antibiotics are over the counter versus in America, we have that strict regulation of you must see a physician, a physician must write a prescription and you must get that prescription from a pharmacy. Um, The biggest thing I saw, at least in Haiti, we went to a we went to a small rural area and uh, was called Fontaine and we stayed at a school. So over there, um, there aren't even healthcare workers. And it, a lot is just relied upon of, um, I guess, members of the society taking people to the city when they need like severe like help and they're in distress. So the biggest thing we did there was, it was essentially um, a clinic to help everyone and anyone where we had... Um, it was a large group of us. There was about 35 of us, uh, about 20 medical students, about six doctors, uh, two pharmacists, two pharmacy students, myself included, and um, a mixture of um, PT, nursing, and non-medical help. And we ran the clinic, and we saw about 800 to 1,000 people a day. A day? With 35 so, people? Yes. Whoa. <laughs> With 35 people. It was it was long days. I'm, I'm not going to, like, sugarcoat it by any means. You were... You were getting up for breakfast around like 6 in the morning, 7 in the morning, and running clinic from 8 a.m. to about 5 p.m., and then you have the stragglers who might need extra attention. Okay, so what I guess what I was getting to in Congress is that we're kind of trying to say that, well, there are a number of underserved areas. Um, When people think of New York, a lot of times they just think of New York City. Uh, In Iowa, we have 99 counties. Uh, Definitely the majority of them are underserved. Uh, is that an issue mm-hmm. in New York where you, because you guys are in upstate, uh, are there underserved areas um, that are maybe outside of the larger cities? Um, not, I can't say any off the top of my head, but there definitely is, um, I would say, a, a groups of people who, although services are there, they're not always accessible. So that may be that due to not having insurance or having specific providers you must see or having, you know, primary care physicians offices that are so overbooked that you have to wait, you know, a month to go in for something that's not urgent. So although we have, I'm not going to say New York State doesn't have um, facilities here because we definitely do, but I would say access sometimes is definitely the limiting factor. And the bottleneck would be just the lack of um accessibility for people to go to which primary care they would like to and schedule appointments when they can just due to just an or like unnecessary amount of patients needing a primary care physician when there isn't one. Okay, so tell me a little bit about um, being a dean student ambassador. Uh, I understand the role holistically that um, the dean would want students uh, to be um, an outreach of uh, their office and to represent the school. But uh, first, how do you become a dean student ambassador? And then what is it about you that the dean said, I trust you with the Buffalo's good name? I guess um, the program in general is, um, except, and you can be a first year, second year, third year, you apply in your first year. 
And it really, um, they take into account just uh, what what experiences have you had and um, I guess yourself as a student and your willingness to help others, in all honesty. Because as a Dean Student Ambassador, you do um, a multitude of things. You help with the admissions process and you might help with that even sitting in on interviews. You have students that might read, reach out to you high school level, undergraduate level, that are interested in the program but may have questions that not everyone always feels comfortable asking an admissions person. So they can ask us comfortably without having that stigmatism of, oh, well, they judge me because I'm really just curious and I'm not sure. Or I don't want them to judge me and think I'm, you know, unintelligent. So and we, we have that opportunity to meet out with um, interested students. We also have the opportunity to do what's called a, a peer mentoring, where about an hour a week we'll sit and if anyone needs help with any of their classes or extracurricular work or even just like not sure what they want to do or want some advisement, we're there for them. And it's really run by um, uh, Jennifer Rosenberg. She's probably the glue that holds it all together because it's a, a decent amount of students. And she does a very good job at letting us know this is what's expected of us and what uh, we should really be promoting as far as the school is concerned. Tell me a little bit about um, Buffalo as a, a research university. A, a lot of times students are, uh, will, will divide schools into small liberal arts versus uh, research intensive. Uh, tell me a little bit about the opportunities you have at a research school. Well, um, yeah, so UB is definitely a large uh, research intensive school. And in that sense, I came from a, a smaller undergraduate, so the field was a little different. My class sizes are about 100 to 130 students. And the thing I really like is whatever you want to get involved in, you really have the opportunity to do so, whether that be um, bench work in the lab. Um, I believe Dr. Uh, Brian Suji, he does a lot of work with antibiotic resistance. So that's op an opportunity there. Or if you were more into like technical computer modeling type of research, um, that's also allowed because um, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics is something that UB definitely prides itself on as available to you. Or if you wanted to even do some more pharmacy practice, pharmacy practice related work, that's available. And I think that's one of the biggest reasons students like coming to our school is that if you're interested in something and you want to further your knowledge about it, although it might not be part of the PharmD curriculum, you have the opportunity to do so. And the faculty is actually very um, welcoming and actually promoting because that they love doing research. That's why they're there at that school. They have um, a passion in mind and they're pursuing it and they have no problem in accepting students to help them along that way. And myself, I'm involved in um, two projects currently. One is affiliated with uh, Buffalo General and is involved in like um, dosing protocols of certain medications, while the other one is like completely opposite end of that spectrum. It's more community related with um, adult refugee education and looking at how we can help better um, inform the refugees about just general health literacy and working the system of like the U.S. healthcare system. Like as you said before in Ireland, when you're used to just going up to a pharmacy and getting some Voltaren gel or some antibiotic and you come to the U.S. where that's not even allowed, nor is it out over the counter, that's like so definitely a culture shock on its own. So that's really what that program, the adult refugee education program is geared towards is giving people who aren't aware exactly how healthcare functions in the U.S. a better understanding and answering questions that they have. So now you're going to be going into your APPEs or APPEs. I've, I've heard them called a bunch of different things. Uh, tell me a little <laughs> bit about how you want to spend your fourth year or what uh, types of uh, uh, rotations you're looking for to kind of further your ability to uh, help these groups and then help the medical missions? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think the, the I, for anyone listening, the best thing is to get involved early. And since I have done that, going on to my, like my appies, I have an idea of what I would like to do. I know I have a more of a residency focus, so I'm looking at more intense inpatient rotations, which would probably be involving um, rotating in an ICU setting. Now, I'm hoping to do them hopefully in Rochester. I've applied for them, so we'll see which ones I get. But the ones I was picking out were more intensive care units and um, more like transplant, just because I'm more 
I'm interested in that. Along with medical mission wise, um, I'm not able to do one as a APP rotation in another country. Just uh, it wasn't I wasn't able to fit it in my schedule. And when you get to that point, you'll understand that there's a lot of factors going into which rotations you're able to do and which rotations you're not able to do. But as far as UB is concerned, they do have some international rotations. They have one, there's a very good one which linked with the Taiwan and the hospital there. They also have one in India. And um, also in Brazil, they had one as well. So like students, if they would choose to and really do have a passion for medical mission trips and would like to further that with a six-week rotation in those areas, they, they're definitely allowed to do so. Myself, I wasn't that I sent, I'm doing them outside of my APPE, so my APPE focuses more inpatient related and research related because you are able to do research APPEs as well, and that's kind of where my focus is lying. Okay, so tell me a little bit about um, your your hopes for residency. Uh, if you were going to do PGY one, I know this is uh, a year and a half away, but uh, what would be ideal for you? Uh, what kind of a center would you be looking at, or uh, what kind of opportunities would you be looking at with residency? Um, I guess I'm, I'm I'm a little biased going to like a research intensive school. I would like to hopefully do a residency in a research intensive facility as well. So I would be looking more at larger places, at least in New York State, like Buffalo General, like uh, SUNY Upstate, or um, even Strong Memorial in Rochester, where you have that ability to not only learn about how a large facility works, where you have multiple factors indicating of, oh, if we make a small change here, it's going to affect our outpatient clinics, it's going to affect our pediatric clinics, and so on and so forth. So when I'm looking towards residencies, I'm definitely looking more for a larger institution where I'm able to learn basically anything and everything, pediatrics, um, geriatrics, cardiology, neurology. I, I'm, I have an idea of what I want to do in the future, but I think getting exposed to as much as you can as a student is definitely the most beneficial. Okay. So just uh, three questions to round this out. Uh, you seem like you've got a lot of um, extracurricular activities, and then you're also keeping your grades up and all of this. Uh, what is it you do on a daily basis to keep your work on track? Are you a list person, or how is it that you manage to fit all these things in? Uh, it sounds like you're doing the work of two students. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Um, I would say um, I definitely spent the first year learning what works and what doesn't work. Like, some people do do lists. I found that doesn't always work well for me. Like, I may make lists. But I'll find myself either adding too much to it or never crossing things off just because I get them done, but I don't have time to go back to my list. The biggest thing that's helped me out is um, learning to retain instead of learning to take an exam. That's probably the biggest thing that's helped me not only in my academics, but in um, extracurricular activities. Because teachers will always give you objectives. They'll always tell you, don't focus on this because it's not on the exam. I found that when I study, I always study. I, first off, the biggest help I've had was from another student was reviewing that day. In pharmacy school, they throw a lot at you every single day, and you're not always going to pick everything up, whether it's like a tweet or a message or something on Instagram that distracts you in class. You're going to probably have to go back and review. So the thing I found that always benefits me is at the end of the day, if I had four classes, six classes that day, I'll spend 10, 20 minutes, not too long, always reviewing what I've We've gone over that day, and that helps me not only retain for the exam, but it helps me retain information for when I'm doing other activities like out in the clinics or out in the community. You've talked a as little far bit. As extra, okay, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say as far as extracurriculars go, it's more just making time for it, and at least at, at my school, they always offer free food for coming to clubs and things, so <laughs> you know, instead of making dinner, I go and get pizza, so that was definitely a benefit of doing those type of things. <laughs> Okay. Um, so you, you obviously listened to a number of mentors, had some great mentors at UB, uh, but tell me what's the best career advice uh, you've ever had or you've ever given? Okay. Um, this is actually not from any of my mentors. It was actually, I asked um, a question at my interview for, I applied for the Wegmans um, internship, pharmacy internship, mm -hmm. and I had the store manager actually sitting in on, on that interview, and I asked him a question. And his response actually um, has helped me definitely throughout this my career so far. Is um, He said, he told me, because I asked him how he got to the position he's in today. He told me that uh, to get to positions where you want to be, 
you should try and be the best at the position you're at now. If you're a cash register person, be the best um, cash register person you can be and look forward from then on. And that's how I've taken the mentality as a student. When I was a first year student, um, residency and like fourth year rotations was not on my mind. My focus was to learn the information and to be exposed to different fields because I was in my first year. In my second year, third year, and so on, that's kind of how I've taken it. Now, at, I, as a second year student, your focus is heavily in academics, so at least um, it tends to be one of the more challenging um, years. So as a second year student, I knew that I had to focus more academically. And then as a third year student, I knew that I have not only the time, but the opportunities to branch out more. And that's what I did. So I guess the best advice I've ever gotten is whatever role you're in currently, be the best you can be at it and then focus on moving forward. Don't look forward and try and do things now to get there, but rather do the best you can at where you're at now and the success will come. Okay. And the final question is what inspires you? Um, what inspires me? I guess that would probably, I would tie back more to my family. Um, my parents were like, um, and they weren't immigrants, but they did, immigrated to America in probably the late eighties and their worth work ethic, the challenges they have faced have definitely been one of the biggest motivating factors for myself to succeed and excel because if they can come from another country, barely speak the language and find success, what's limiting me? I was born here. I should have I have all the tools necessary, and I think that's honestly one of the benefits of being an American is that we have so much opportunity given to us, and it would be foolish not to take advantage of it. I would say that's probably what motivates me the most. Okay, well, thanks so much for being on the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. Yeah, and thank you for having me. Support for this episode comes from the audiobook Memorizing Pharmacology, a relaxed approach. With over 9,000 sales in the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia, it's the go-to resource to ease the pharmacology challenge. Available on Audible, iTunes, and Amazon.com. In print, ebook, and audiobook. Thank you for listening to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. Be sure to share the show with the hashtag #PharmacyLeaders. 